Hello, hello everyone. In this video, we are going to talk about the one-way ANOVA and what we need to think about when we run one. As I mentioned in the video about the student t-test, it is easy to do stats to produce a p-value, especially with PRISM, but it is difficult to do good stats, as in stats we can believe to actually quantify how much we can trust what our data are telling us. In a nutshell, we use a one-way ANOVA when we want to know if there are differences between several groups of values. Now, we are not talking about any values. First, the values need to be continuous. They also need to show normality and homogeneity of variance, as the one-way ANOVA belongs to the parametric family. More on that in the video on data exploration. Okay, so one way to think about statistics and statistical significance is to consider the trade-off between absolute effect and viability. In the case of the ANOVA, the effect is the difference between the means of the groups versus the viability, the noise within the groups. It can be quantified with the so-called signal-to-noise ratio. Many parametric statistical tests, such as the ANOVA, are variation on the theme of that ratio, which we want big, right? A big difference between the groups of values and very little viability within, so that we can discriminate between them. This ratio comes from physics, and these guys say that if the noise is low, then the signal is detectable and bingo, for us, this is statistical significance. But if the noise, for example, the inter-individual viability is high, then the same signal will not be detected and we don't reach statistical significance. And the ANOVA is pretty much about that. As we just saw, the signal will be the difference between the means and the noise, the viability within the groups. And the ratio of the two will give us F, chosen for Fisher, a big name in stats. Anyway, this is the statistic produced by Dianova. Now, let me show you how it works. So let's imagine that we have five groups of values, A to E, and we want to see if there are differences between these groups. Whatever package or software we use to run an ANOVA, at one stage, we will get a table like this one. And in real life, we would go straight to the p-value here. But today, I want to show you how we get this p-value so that you understand what the ANOVA does. The first thing it does is to quantify the total amount of noise in the data. So all the values, regardless of the group to which they belong, are put together, and the mean of these values is calculated. That's the grand mean. Then the differences from each point and that mean are calculated. Here we have 78 values, so that's 78 differences, also called errors, which are squared and summed up, and it gives us the sum of squared errors, or sum of squares in short, which is 69.9 in this example. Next, we want to look at the differences between so the same thing is done, but this time between each of the five means and that same grand mean. It gives us five differences, which we square and add up. That is the sum of squares between the groups. Finally, we do it one last time, but this time between each group, where the differences between each value and the group to which it belongs are calculated and again squared up and added up. That's the within groups sum of squares. Okay, so now remember, we want to compare the signal with the noise, the difference between the means with the viability within the groups. But with the values we have here, we cannot do it because we cannot compare sums from groups of different sizes. To be able to make a comparison, we need to divide the sums by the size of the samples from which they are calculated. Here, we don't exactly divide these sums by the sample sizes, but by the number of degrees of freedom n minus 1 except that when we are talking about number of groups, we do not use the letter N, but we use the letter K, whatever. So between groups, degrees of freedom is 4 here. As for the within groups, degrees of freedom, we have 5 groups, so 5 times N minus 1, each time N being the sample size for one of the 5 groups. So in the end, we get N minus K. If you want to know more about degrees of freedom, check out the video on descriptive stats. So, if we divide the sum of squares by the degrees of freedom, we get the mean squares, which are also quite simply the variances, hence analysis of variance, haha. <laughs> anyway, one last step. 
the calculation of the F ratio, which is quite simply the ratio of the variance between the groups and the one within the groups. And if we want to reach significance, we want that ratio to be big, right? Big difference between the groups and small viability within. And that's what we got here. So, okay. So far, so good. We have a p-value which tells us that there is a difference between the groups overall. But what we want more often than not is the significance about pairwise comparisons, like our groups B and C different from group A, for instance. So now we need to talk about family-wise error rate. And why is that? Well, because running multiple tests on the same data increases the family-wise error rate. Okay, so to understand that concept, we need to talk about probability for a minute. Now, do not be alarmed, it is dead easy. We have to think about one of the basic rules or laws of probability, the multiplicative rule, which states that the probability of the joint occurrence of two or more independent events is the product of the individual probabilities. So, for example, if we throw a coin twice, the probability of having two heads in a row is simply the multiplication of the two individual probabilities. And always be intuitive. It is less likely to get two heads than one, hence the probability is smaller. Makes sense. Now, let's apply it to the ANOVA. Let's say that we have three groups A, B and C, and we want to compare them all to one another. Now, let's look at the type 1 error, which should never be above 5%, right? To get through that example, it is actually easier to think about the probability of not making the type 1 error, which is then 95% or more. If we apply the multiplicative rule here, then when running three independent pairwise comparisons, the overall probability of no type 1 error is 0.857. So, if we reverse back to know the probability of making at least one type 1 error, we get 14.3%. The probability has increased from 5% to 14%. And if we were making comparisons between five groups instead of three, the family-wise error rate is 40%. That is what the family-wise error rate is about. It increases proportionally to the number of comparisons run within a given data set. So, what can we do about it? The solution to the increase of family-wise error rate is to correct for multiple comparisons. So, over the years, statisticians have developed different ways to correct for multiple comparisons. Some of them you may have heard of, like John Tukey, for instance. Now, if they all came up with their own special recipe, they all had one thing in common. Since, as we just saw, the more tests we run, the higher the family-wise error rate get, it follows that the more tests we run, the more stringent the correction has to be if we want to keep the type 1 error no higher than 5%. I am going to illustrate it with Carlo Bonferroni's correction, because it is the easiest. We can even do it by hand. The guy chose an approach totally brilliant in its simplicity. He thought, right, the more comparisons I make, the more likely I am to make the type 1 error. So easy, to have a stringency directly proportionate to the number of comparisons I make, I am going to divide the threshold for significance by the number of comparisons. So if I have three comparisons, for instance, the threshold will be 0.016. In practice, people do it the other way around, actually. They multiply the p-values by the number of comparisons, so 3, for example, here, and then compare it to the classic 5%. Much more intuitive. Okay, so totally brilliant, but very conservative, hence leading to loss of power and lots of false negative. For 10 comparisons, for instance, the threshold for significance is 0.005, so super hard to reach significance. That's why, as the number of comparisons increases, people tend to choose less conservative corrections, like the two key one, for instance, which is less stringent, as you can see. So, easier to reach significance. By the way, if you are a bit shaky about these concepts, check out the video on power. Okay, now, enough theory, let's... We are going to look at the effect of diet on lobster's weight and why not. But before doing any stats, remember the cardinal rule. First, data exploration. As I said before, the ANOVA is a parametric test, so it only works on data which show normality and homogeneity of variance. A quick look here is enough to reassure us. Even if the samples are small, the data do not seem to behave in a dodgy way. We can also see that the three diets are mussels, pellets, and flakes. Hmm. Now, the ANOVA is a two-step analysis. 
First, we have the omnibus test, that's step one, which tells us about the overall difference between the means, but not which means are significantly different from which other. We saw how it works a few slides ago. And then step two, post hoc test, from the Latin meaning after the event. So test we run after the ANOVA itself. These will tell us if there are or not differences between the means pairwise and a correction for multiple comparisons will be applied on the p-values. These post hoc tests should only be used when the ANOVA finds a significant effect. Now, as always, to run stats in PRISM is intuitive and quite First, we need to pick ANOVA in colon stats. Then PRISM wants to know about the design of the experiment and also about the assumptions, so normality and homogeneity of variance. By the way, if the data are a bit dodgy, PRISM has recently introduced a cool new test, the Brown Foresight and Welsh test. Then we need to pick the pairwise comparisons we are interested in. That is not stats business. It is about the original questions behind the design and should be decided before collecting the data. Here, I went for comparing all the diets together because it made sense to me. Then we can choose about which correction we want and remember that some are more conservative than others. Whatever you choose, it is important to be consistent across a manuscript or a paper. Finally, we can check the assumptions graphically with residual plots. Here, I chose a QQ plot because it's really cool. I explain more about QQ plots in the video on descriptive stats. Okay, so the ANOVA is a two steps analysis, so PRISM gives us two tabs. Let's go through the first one, ANOVA results. First, the assumptions. Let's check that we can trust what the ANOVA will tell us before getting excited. So here PRISM offers four tests to check out the first assumption and phew, they all agree to say we are okay. The QQ plot looks a bit bumpy, but the residuals still line up nicely, so all good. Second assumption, homogeneity of variance. PRISM offers two tests here, Brown Foresight, remember I mentioned these guys a slide ago, and Bartlett test. Again, they agree to say that the data meet the second assumption. Now, the p-values for all these tests are not significant because there is no significant departure from normality, nor is there a significant difference in variability between the three groups of values. Then the ANOVA table, which you should recognize with the sum of squares, the degrees of freedom, and the mean squares. Because the F ratio and the p-value are usually the bits people are excited about, they are also reported at the top. Finally, the pairwise comparisons. I went for two key here, and we can see that lobsters get significantly fatter on mussels and flakes. Or is it that they eat more of the former because they prefer it? Hmm. Anyway, ANOVA, there you go. Thank you for listening, and don't forget, stats don't have to be scary.